Um, when Jens asked me almost a year ago whether I would be interested in talking here at Meeting C++, I said immediately, yes, without thinking. And I'm very glad that I did. Um, but two months later, Jens asked, hey, what do you want to talk about? And I said, hmm, <laughs> what can I talk about? And I came up with a list of titles for, uh, for the talk. And one of the first choices I had was uh, to, to call the talk Back to the Future. But then I thought, nah, that's not good enough. There has to be something more provocative. So I got, went for plain threads are the go-to of uh, today's computing. Um, we have a couple of people here who, you, who actually might remember the actual, the, 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 the original paper from Dijkstra, which was published in 1968. Um, where So it was published in 1968. And um, it was a time where people were mainly programming in assembly and a bit of Fortran. Um, and not the modern Fortran we have today, but the, the ancient Fortran. Um, and at that time, um, Dijkstra wrote in his paper, since a number of years, I'm familiar with the observation that the quality of programmers is a decreasing function of the density of go-to statements in the programs they produce. Later, I discovered why the use of the go-to statement has such a disastrous effect, and did uh, I become convinced that the go-to statements should be abolished from all higher level coding. Well, the word, last word is missing. Um, what do you think uh, was the main reason people were against that proposal and against those objections? Any ideas? People were afraid of performance degradation. They said, hey, if we have to use ifs and fors and, and these structures programming things, our programs will be slower. Well, luckily enough, nowadays, everybody believes that Dijkstra was right because the, the raise in, in, in um, abstraction the banning of go-to from, from use in the program languages actually made code more readable and allowed people to think about their code in a more reasonable way. Um, let's move forward for 50 years, <clears throat> almost. Uh, that's a quote I took from the web um, from John Carmack. He published that two weeks ago or so, um, where he says, a large fraction of the flaws in software development are due to programmers not fully understanding all the possible states their code may be in. In a multi-threaded environment, the lack of understanding and the resulting problems are greatly amplified almost to the point of panic if you pay attention. And I said, wow, that's exactly what I need. And again, if you think about what are the main objections of people today to um, go the step and to raise the abstraction level of multi-threading, you will get one answer. They are afraid that the performance of their code will degrade when they don't be, or when they, when they stop using low-level threading in their code. So you see the trend. So I really hope that 50 years from now, everybody will be convinced that, hey, using plain thread is just the wrong thing to do, and we are all convinced that higher level abstractions and programming language is the right thing to use. So let's see. Um, Jens did some surveys. I want to do a survey as well. I asked that question before, but let's, let's ask that question again. How many of you have actually written code which is using more than one thread? Wow, okay, that's much more than I expected. How many, how many of you have been writing code using more than 10 threads? Sizable, 100 threads, hmm? still some. Thousand threads, threads. What do you think are threads? Thousand threads, I will explain what a threads is in a second. Okay, still some. 10,000 threads, 100,000. A million, a billion, okay. So you see the trend, okay? And that's exactly what I, 
I'm deeply convinced that if we raise the abstraction level of uh, the software abstractions on top of plain threads, we will make multi-threading available to the average programmer to a scale of millions of threads without any problems. So let's, let's try to explain what I mean by that. <clears throat> but first of all, I want to uh, discuss what a thread is. Anybody knows what a thread is? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Please go ahead. I'll repeat what, what you say. Okay. So scheduling a piece of code on a stack. Is that what you're saying? Sorry, I can't, can't really hear you. It might be a good idea to, to get a mic to you anyway. Oh. Okay. I, I would define it like this, that you have a, a set of pro, uh, register values and uh, a stack. Okay. Um, and it's a scheduling unit uh, within one process, so mm -hmm. the, okay. it... Okay, very good, very yeah. good. Um, I thought, let's look at the standard, what the standard says. And interestingly enough, the standard has no definition of a thread. Um, it says, well, it has several things which are close. It talks about a thread of execution um, as a single flow of control within a program. Paragraph 1.10.1. 1. Um, in other places, it talks about std thread, the abstraction we have today to abstract a thread. And that is specified as a component that can be used to create and manage threads, where threads is explicitly me, uh, referred to a thread of execution. Uh, please note, nowhere in the standard it says that a thread is a OS thread or a kernel thread. Um, and there's another thing the standard mentions uh, that is an execution agent, where the standard, mean, uh, the, the quote is, an execution agent is defined as an entity such as a thread that may perform work in parallel with other execution agents. In addition, um, there is um, a close relationship between the definition of thread and the happens before relationship. Um, I personally don't like that happens before thing because it puts too much emphasis on concurrency instead of parallelism. And in, in that talk, I specifically and very deliberately make a distinction between concurrency and parallelism. Whenever I talk about concurrency, I will mean ex the execution of two or more threads at the same time accessing the same global state. When I talk about parallelism, I mean two independent executions which might run in parallel or concurrently, but might not, okay? And that's a very important distinction because I believe that most problems people have with multi-threading comes from the concurrency side of things and not from the parallelism side of things. So one of the conclusions I want to convey today is stop doing concurrency in your code. Focus on parallelism and you will be fine. And I hope to, to give you some examples there. <clears throat> um, by the way, I, not all the things I'm talking about today are just my results. Many things are taken from other places, from collaborators, from the web, from the standard, and I'll all, always reference it on the slides um, just to, to give credit where credit is due. So what is a threat? And actually, what I believe is a threat is a bit fairly close to what you were saying. I think a thread is an entity which exposes four properties. A single flow of control, so a sequence of opcodes or some execution, some, some commands. Um, a program counter which marks a point in the execution flow which is currently being executed. An associated context, execution context like stack, registers, dynamic memory, static memory, everything, thread local variables, everything which defines the context of the local execution. 
And last but not least, and I think almost the most important one is a threat state. So it's either initialized, running, suspended, whatever, you know, pending, those things. Uh, please note that in that definition, a kernel running on a GPU is a threat, is one threat, even if you run it on 10,000 GPU cores, okay? Because all the cores do the same thing at the same time. It's SIMD, right, it's SIMD. Or executing vector operations in, in, in the vector unit in, in, your, in your CPU is one threat as well. Okay, so why are plain threats considered harmful? Or why do I think that plain threats are very harmful for coding? And uh, this, some of those points are taken from a paper which has been published in 2006, but there are other people who have been publishing these things as well. Uh, the main problem is that threats are not composable. It's impossible to tell whether a library or another function you're calling actually creates threats on itself. So you're kind of prone to massive oversubscription of the system. You have no control how many threads will run in the system. Um, parallelism with plain threads can't be disabled. So you, if, you want, if you create the threads explicitly, you can't debug the code with running on one thread only. So you can't make sure that sequentially the logic is there, but uh, I have some multi-threading issues or so because the program logic is very closely tied to the parallelism even if two threads don't necessarily run at the same time. And uh, humans are feeble minds. They can do one thing at a time. Well, my wife claims she can do two things at a time. I can't do that. Uh, you have to ask female population, and I'm very glad, by the way, to see many female uh, human beings in the C++ community. <laughs> um, because in the US, and it's much higher percentage uh, than, than in, in any, any US community I've been, I've been uh, talking or, or visiting or so, so I'm very glad about that. Jens, keep that going. It's probably your charm or so, penalty. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's difficult to load balance manually. Uh, even the smallest differences in runtimes of threads lead to um, uh, is have a large influence on, on performance. Other issues. There are no, there's no standard way of returning a value from a thread, but all require some explicit synchronization, which again goes into the uh, concurrency domain. Working with threads makes concurrency explicit, and I believe that's the wrong thing. We should make concurrency hidden away, stashed away under the hood, uh, in the very same way as the go-to statements are still used, but nobody's using them explicitly, right? Whenever you write if, the compiler generates a branch. It's just in go-to. So concurrency is difficult to get right with large number of concurrent threads, and it's very, very difficult to reason about. Uh, last but not least, I believe threads are slow, and I will explain what slow actually means in a second. So my conclusion at this point is we need explicit parallelism in the, in the language, and we need it well integrated into C++. So things like OpenMP, where you put a pragma in there and the compiler doesn't know anything about that, is the wrong approach. OpenMP is wrong for other reasons, and I will touch that, but one of the reasons is that it's not well integrated with the language. <coughs> We need higher level parallelism constructs, and we need programming models which help to express parallelism in our code. As I already said, people don't like multi-threaded programming uh, for mainly one reason. And I talked to Joachim yesterday, and it kind of occurred to me, yeah, that's the reason. He said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to get it wrong because it's so complex. And if you w were listening to, to the talk today about threading, it, it, you know, I even felt panic when, when I saw all these things, you know, doing the mutexes right and getting the, con the condition variable used properly is something which is beyond the capability of, an, of a mere mortal programmer, right? Um, it's, it's that I don't know who, who, who came up with that quote saying, if you 
write code which is at, at, the, at the limit of your capabilities. And debugging is 10 times more difficult than writing code, then by definition you are not able to debug your code. So we, we have to write code in a way that we are still able to debug it. So we can't write code just barely managing to, to get it right. Okay, threads are slow. Um, this is a, a, an, an image of Tianhe 2, the current officially world's largest machine. Uh, I don't know if you know the top 500 list. Two, twice a year, top 500 list is published where the largest machines based on a silly benchmark but still some, somehow ranked uh, are listed. Uh, it's a Chinese machine which consists out of 16,000 nodes connected with a high-speed network. Um, roughly 3.2 uh, million compute cores in, uh, in, in 32,000 Intel Xeon Sandy Bridge uh, cores and 48,000 Xeon Phi um, coprocessor boards. So now just imagine writing code which does 3.2 million things at a time, all the time, round the clock. And uh, not surprisingly, if you look at the parallel efficiency applications usually reach on this kind of machines, then you will see that the parallel efficiency is in a range of 10 to 15, 20%. That means 80% 80, 80 of the energy used by those machines is just wasted. And the energy requirements are quite high. That machine in particular has an energy a budget of 32 megawatts. So they have probably a, a nuclear power station right next to it just to, one half is used to heat it up, the other half is, is used to cool it down again. So that, <laughs> yeah, it's 55 petaflops, that's 55, times 10 to the power of 15 floating point operations per second. Uh, yeah, you, you might say, hey, what relation do I have to that machine? I mean, nobody has access here in the room to that machine. And when, when I was preparing that, I was just going back 20 years and w was looking at the top 500 list 20 years back in 1994. And the top 500 machine the, on, on the first machine and 20 years ago, uh, was a virtual tunnel, a uh, wind tunnel, a Japanese machine, which had a peak performance of 160 gigaflops. Okay, you might not have, have a feeling how much that is, but if somebody of you have an iPhone 6, it has a higher flops rate than that machine 20 years ago. Okay? So your iPhone 6 is more powerful than the most powerful computer 20 years ago. So just by extrapolation, uh, just think about where we will go, okay? Um, so that's a machine. On the other hand, we have something like Amdahl's law, and I promise that's the only formula I will show today. Amdahl's law, for those who don't know it, describes uh, the theoretical limit of achievable strong scaling um, if you take into account the percentage of the code which runs in parallel and the percentage of the code which runs sequentially in your application. Um, P is a proportion of the parallel to, to sequential code, so it's something between zero and one. S is achievable, theoretically achievable speed up, and N is the number of processors. And the graph here show you the green line, um, which tops out at a speed up of 20, even for 65,000 cores, is the graph which corresponds to that formula when you parallelized your code 95%. So only 5% of your code is not parallelized, is sequential, and that means that if all you can do with your code is parallelize it 95% of your code and keep 5% sequential, that you can throw as many resources as you want at the, at the problem, and it won't run faster than 20 times the sequential version. And the reason is very simple, right? Because you can speed up the parallel part of your code as much as you want, but you still are stuck with a 5% sequential execution, which is 120th, right? So 90, 95%. Um, and in other words, if you turn that around and say, hey, we want to use Tian A2, 3.2 million cores, 
yeah, that means that we have to parallelize the code 99.9999999999%. And now think back, how much of your code have you ever parallelized, even if you have run code with hundreds of threads? I.O., initialization, whatnot, right? There are so many small pieces in your code which run sequentially, which just let Amdo beat you over the head and you can throw as many resources as you, as you want, it won't run faster. And that's why the parallel efficiency of those applications are usually is not very good. Uh, but let's make things even worse. Um, if you think about what are the reasons why our applications are slow, um, and you ask 100 people, you usually get 200 answers. Well, I believe there are four answers, four reasons why our applications are slow, which I call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, because that's the, the, the factors which, which inhibit our applications to run faster. Very quickly, first one is starvation. Starvation, when I talk about starvation, I mean the, that there's insufficient concurrent work to maintain high utilization of the resources, so you don't have enough parallelism in your system. Latencies. That's the time distance delay to remote services. Overheads. Work for manage, overheads are, is that work you have to perform in order to manage your parallelism. If you run sequential code, you, you don't need any, any, you don't have any parallel overheads because you don't have to manage parallelism. So overheads appear only when you do parallelization. And the more parallelization you do, the more overheads you have to add to, you, to your code. And the last one, waiting for contention resolution. Um, Contention is kind of the opposite of starvation. It's, it's, it's when you have too much work for a particular resource and you can't get the throughput you need, like memory bus limitations or, or other things. And so you can remember it nicely. I just highlighted the first letters. And that's the reason why our applications are slow. And the bad thing is that these four, re, uh, f four factors impose additional upper bounds on both, on weak and strong scaling of our applications. So we have to find a way to get rid of those or to kind of compensate for those four horsemen. We can't do anything about MDAL, but we can do things about the, the four horsemen. Okay. Um, in the beginning of that talk, I, I want to give you some facets from, from different angles, and in the end, I, I, I try to, to get, get that together and make my point. Um, that's why, um, for, for me personally, the overheads are the worst of, of, of all the four horsemen, because they, the more you parallelize, the more effort you have to put into managing your parallelism, right? If you run a million threads, you have to schedule them, you have to create them, you have, and, and so on and so on. And the more threads you have, the more overheads you have. So I decided to do a uh, Gedanken experiment, one of those nice words the English guys didn't have an equivalent for, um, like Schadenfreude. <laughs> Some typical German word, apparently. So they decided to use that. Um, so let's, and, and that, that thought experiment I want to do is, let's assume we have 10 seconds of work. Just 10 seconds of work. But these 10 seconds of work are very simple to parallelize because you, we can theoretically run as, we can split it in as small tasks as we want, up to one microsecond. So it's essentially 10 million tasks, one microsecond each. And what I want to look at is what is the overall runtime of the system if you um, take into account overheads for single created, for, for each of the threads created. And then you run different amounts of work on each of the threads and, and just see how, how that thing behaves. The dotted line corresponds to the sequential execution time. It's uh, just as a, as a reference, so everything is scaled to that. Um, if you assume that our threads we create have only one microsecond overhead, so I have to spend one microsecond to create the thread, to schedule it, to run it, and so, and, and, and so on, only one microsecond per thread, then you get this dependency. Um, Let's talk about that a bit. So the left end, uh, left hand side means that I run each of my microsecond work items on a single new thread. Okay, so on, on, the, on the left hand side I run 10 million threads. And on the right hand side I run everything on one thread. So it's just one thread with 10 million uh, microseconds, so with, with 10 seconds. And um, if you think about it, 
what you see is, is kind of logic, right? It's logical because the more threads you create, the more overheads you have, and the runtime goes through the roof at a certain point. Um, the right-hand side is not as easy to understand why it's going up again. Um, but if you think about it, it's kind of kind of obvious because uh, this graph was created for 16 cores, so we have 16 compute elements, and on those 16 compute elements, you run all those threads. And that means that uh, right of, of that point, roughly, to the right, you have less threads than compute elements. So you don't use system, and, and that, that causes the runtime to go up again. So it's kind of the starvation part of, of the four horsemen kicking in, and on that end, it's, it's overhead. Um, if we assume we have 100 microsecond overhead per thread, you get this. And if we assume that we have 10 millisecond overhead, we get this. And now think about what is standard thread, what is the overhead of a std thread or of a kernel thread? You will roughly reach 10 milliseconds, right? Because of operating system time slicing and, and all these things, operating system uh, handles these threads. So you can easily have 10 millisecond overhead to create one thread. Another observation is that we have a clear minimum, which is essentially defined by Amdahl's law plus some, some minimal overhead of, of scheduling. Um, the brown line, while it still has a minimum, and even if you do parallelization with standard always with kernel threads, um, and I kind of mix up standard threads with kernel threads because almost all implementations just have a one-on-one -on -one mapping of, of a standard thread to, to a kernel thread, then you see that you don't have that wiggle room in terms of grain size of amount of work executed on one thread to hit the minimum because it's not that pronounced. And even if you find the minimum, you can't reach the best possible speed up, right? The ratio between, well, that line gives you, gives you the speed up, right? because it's, it's, I don't know, 1.08 or something. So it's 16 times faster, essentially, than, than the sequential code. And that means that if you do the same experiment just with kernel threads, you can't reach the, the best possible performance. You can't even get close to Amdahl. So what, we, what do we learn from that? First, even relatively small amounts of work can benefit from being split into smaller tasks, into very small tasks, theoretically. Even creating, when creating a possibly huge number of, co uh, of threads, right? In our experiment, we just have um, 10 million threads, or up to 10 million threads, we considered up to 10 million threads, and the optimum was in the range when we ran 10,000 threads, okay? And that's why it's so easy to reach a million thread, right? If, if, if the work you're executing is very small only, then you can, can easily work with, with a large number of threads. Um, the problem here is that it certainly is not possible to use that many kernel threads. It's impossible to reason about this amount of, of tasks again. And that means we, again, need an abstraction mechanism. So what are the challenges we are facing today? The challenge is, is that we need to find a way, a manageable way, to fully parallelize our codes, our applications. And when I say fully, I mean fully. Because otherwise, we just don't utilize the resources we have. The goals are certainly to defeat the four horsemen, um, to provide a manageable paradigm and an API for handling the parallelism to expose asynchrony, and many people have been talking about asynchrony already at this conference, and parallelism to the programmer without exposing concurrency, or without raising the concurrency level at least. And very important, we will see that in, in a second, we have to make our data dependencies explicit. We have to hide the notion of threads, communication, and data distribution as much as possible. And then we will be able to, to do that. Okay. So, stepping aside, <clears throat> and I will get back to the main theme in, in a second. Um, I, I've been working for six or seven years now uh, uh, developing a library which is called HPX, which is a general purpose runtime system for uh, applications of any scale. 
Um, and I want to give you two slides about HPX, because not because I want to make an advertisement here, but because in the code examples I will show later, I will show things which are theoretically proposed already to in, in different standard um, proposals, but have not been implemented in a coherent way, way anywhere except in HPX. So just to give you some background about, about what the code is doing, and for you to uh, actually experiment with it, um, I, I will want to, want to say a word or two about HPX. So it's a general purpose runtime system, which is solidly based on a theoretical foundation, um, a well-defined execution model. We believe that the uh, current programming models uh, are based, like OpenMP or MPI or other parallelization techniques, are based on an execution model which has been designed uh, 50 years, 60 years ago. Essentially, the von Neumann, von Neumann model or the Harvard abstract machine or however you want to call it. And the, these, these abstract models and the implementation we have today are not adequate for the, for the current generation of hardware anymore, even more for the future uh, generation of hardware. So we need a new approach, and we try to develop that execution model and to implement the ideas around that in HPX. Um, HPX gives you a uniform standards-oriented API for ease of programming of parallel and distributed applications. So HPX is a runtime system which not only runs on one system, you can run it on a cluster, you can run it in a distributed environment, <coughs> uh, which allows you to write fully asynchronous code with hundreds of millions of threads easily and provides a unified syntax for semantic and semantics for local and remote operation. So it doesn't matter whether the operation you're working with is local or on a different node in the system, the API is the same. Um, it enables writing applications, and we have proven that the applications you can write with this outperform existing equivalent applications which have been tuned for years by, by specialists. Um, it's open source. Uh, you can download it from, from, the, from GitHub. It's boost licensed. So even if a company thinks about using it, fine, go ahead. Um, and it can be used as a research platform um, for experimentation for your own needs. Just to give you an idea of what we did, we just took all the facilities of the C++11 standard and re-implemented them. And the reason why we implemented them is mainly two, A, performance, 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 uh, and the fourth reason is uh, distributed operation. And that's why we implemented function, tuple, any, and all these things, because these um, additional facilities have to be serializable. You want to bind a function on one node, send it over the wire, and invoke it on the other one, okay? So for these two reasons, we implemented these things. And we try to stay as close as possible to the standard in terms of semantics. So in the end, if you have a working C++11 program, just exchange standard for HPX, recompile, done, should work. The main reason why we did that, the first three, three reasons I mentioned, performance, 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 just one graph to give you an idea. Um, this graph shows you the number of threads executed in HPX, or you can execute in HPX, uh, over a number of cores. In that case, 20 cores is a 20 core machine, an Ivy Bridge machine. And as you can see, uh, on 20 cores, we can roughly execute 25 million threads a second. That means uh, the overhead of a thread is in the range of 700 nanoseconds. And now you see why I gave you that graph in the beginning, because um, when you shrink the overhead of the thread, you suddenly have the, op the opportunity and the possibility to schedule very, very small tasks, a very small amount of work, um, and we will see why that is beneficial in a second. So let's get back to the parallelism part of it. Um, I mentioned explicit parallelism, and um, the general understanding from my end is that C++ needs a much stronger support for higher level par uh, parallelism. C++ 11 has some of the basic facilities People have mentioned future, promise, package task, async, but much, much more is needed. And what I want to do, I want to look at the current, currently uh, uh, the work of the standardization committee, which is currently going on. And the standardization committee has decided not to put everything into the next standard, but to create working groups 
and each of the working groups will produce one or more TS, which stands for technical specification, which was done in 2003, I think, for the uh, TL1. It was called TR at that point, now it's called TS for some arcane standard reasons or st uh, standardization body reasons. And I want to focus essentially on two or three of those technical specifications, which are about to, um, which uh, went through the first ballot, international ballot already, and which are about to be published in, in the next year or so. Uh, the main ones are uh, TS concurrency. I think it should be called asynchrony, but it's called concurrency and the technical specification about parallelism. There's other work being done, uh, resumable functions, very important, um, task regions, executors, Detlef talked about executors, so I, I will not, not say too much. For those interested, you can, can refer to, to Detlef's talk. Um, but first of all, and that's the reason why I call, wanted to, to give that talk the name Back to the Future, I want to talk about futures. What is a future in C++? While the idea of a future is very old, um, they have been first published and described in 1975, I believe. Uh, so it's a very, very old concept. Like, like many of those old concepts are re-emerging now. Um, so let's talk about what a future is. A future is an object representing a result which has not been computed yet. And that might sound trivial, but the implications are tremendous. Um, just Let's look at that graph. The wiggled line are threads. So let's assume on locality one, it could be a NUMA domain, it could be a node, it could be whatever uh, entity you're looking at. Um, a thread is executing, and the thread knows that at some point it has some computation to be, do uh, to be done which can be separated, and it knows that the result of that computation will be needed later. So it creates a future object kicking off that computation which is run in some other locality. And uh, whenever the, the original con uh, consumer thread actually needs a value, which has to be computed on, on the side, um, it suspends because the value has not been computed yet. Other work is being done on the core. Other threads are being scheduled uh, while that initial thread is being suspended. And whenever the result comes back from the, from the producer thread, the future becomes ready and the original thread can resume and can, can work. Um, that's a very beautiful concept because it enables transparent synchronization with a, with a producer and we will see some code in a second. It hides the notion of dealing with threads. That's exactly what, I, what I'm, I'm aiming for. It makes a synchrony manageable and you will see why. It allows for composition of several asynchronous operations easily. And it turns concurrency into parallelism. Well, I put that into parentheses, not mainly for the reason that futures themselves don't turn concurrency into parallelism. But when you start using futures in, in a broad scale, massively, you, in my experience, you, you start developing a coding style which is very much oriented towards parallelism and kind of diminishes the role of concurrency. And we will see why. Uh, well, I thought, thought we, we talked about 42 several times, so I m base my example on, on the universal answer uh, for life, for universe, and everything else, which is, we know, 42. But sadly enough, it takes 7.5 million years to compute that answer. We know all that, right? We, we read about it. So what we do, we create a computer, which is called Deep Thought, obviously. And uh, we tell the computer, hey, calculate that, that answer for us. And we do that with async. Async, the standard says, async runs a function as if on a new thread, okay? So universal answer will be run on a separate thread. We, we, it returns, returns immediately, gives us a future for the value which will be computed at some point in the future. Then you go on with your life because you want to do other things in 7.5 million years, right? You don't want to wait for it to be computed. And when you are finally done, uh, and, and the result has to be there, then you call get. And two things can happen. Either the result has been returned and the future, just the get returns immediately, gives you the value, or the value has not been returned and the future suspends and waits inside get. And that's exactly what I mean. You don't see even that threads are involved. That runs on, one, on a machine with one core, that runs on a machine with 100 cores, 
you don't care. There's no explicit notion of threats and no explicit notion of synchronization, which makes it so beautifully usable. So let's talk about the concurrency TS, uh, which is N4107. As I said, it's a misnomer. I believe it should be called a synchrony TS because it's essentially about extensions to standard future. Standard future as it is in C++11 today is useless because all you can do, you can call get, uh, the operating system will suspend the thread and you have no idea what's going on. That's why um, what they propose in that uh, paper is to add additional facilities mainly to do composition of futures. One is dot then, we heard about that, uh, for sequential uh, composition and for parallel composition, the two functions proposed or several functions proposed, when any and when all, which are variadic uh, functions taking one or, so, or, or more futures and they give you another future which represents the, the logical operations on, on, on the arguments. And some helper facilities like make ready future, which gives you a future pre-initialized and make exceptional future, which gives you a pre-initialized future but with an, with an error code in it. We, ha we have seen many of those examples here so I'll, I'll just skim over the code. The first is uh, sequential composition of futures. Well, I just spawn a new thread with async. I get a future back which represents a value. And then I call dot then on the future. And dot then takes a function object. And the function will be invoked whenever the future becomes ready and passes the future itself to the function. So f, the argument f to that lambda is essentially the same as f1. Uh, the function has been attached to as a continuation. Um, dot then itself returns another future which represents the result of the continuation itself. And that's a nice thing. So you can chain these, these things, right? You, you essentially define continuations upon continuations, which gives you an asynchronous style of computing. Um, parallel composition, very similar. Let's say we have two futures, one a shared future was and gives you an int, uh, the other one is a future with a string, and you call when all, and when all gives you back a future which represents, which has a tuple of the two initial futures you passed as the arguments. And the future returned becomes ready whenever both of the futures you passed as arguments are ready. And then you can attach something to when all if you want and do some work when both input arguments have become ready. So far, very easy. Uh, what we added in HPX to it is a facility which we call Dataflow. Um, what if async, if some of the arguments to async are futures themselves, what would you do? Well, if you use async, then the futures would be passed through only and the function has to deal with them. But if you change the behavior, if you say my function will be invoked only after all the arguments which are futures have become ready, and you use the same essentially API as async, uh, then you gain a completely different semantic. And you might not immediately realize that, but this simple semantic change changes everything. And I will give you some examples. So if one of the arguments is a future, it, the invocation of f will be delayed. And if uh, one of the arguments is not a future, it will just be passed through to the invocation. Uh, one note, in HPX, we decided not to go with that quirk that async, the future return from async is special. So it doesn't block in the end. Uh, if the value has not been extracted from the future, it doesn't uh, block in the destructor. And we can do that because we have full control over this threading and we, we have not the problem that the threads can, can run away. And that makes programming, by the way, much, much simpler. Um, okay, so far for data flow. I will get back to data flow. The parallelism TS. The parallelism TS is defining parallel algorithms um, based on what we know in STL today. It's all about fork join parallelism. So what about fork join parallelism? Most of you know that. It's used for years in Silk, in OpenMP, in Java, in, in, in .NET, and so on. So if you assume that we have three blocks of tasks where A, B, and C can run in parallel, uh, 
the other four can run in parallel and the last two can run in parallel, but in between you have to join, then you theoretically could run them as this way, right? You have, you can run them in parallel and have join points in between. Um, just as a side note, that's exactly why fork join parallelism is so deadly for nice parallelization. Because as you see, we have nice parts of sequential execution in between our parallel sections. And we just learned how, how bad that is if we only have minuscule sequential parts in the execution. But for join relies on joining all the threads. And if you ever have written an OpenMP loop, you might not have realized that there's an implicit join after the, the, the parallel loop. And you might think, hey, great, I parallelized everything. No, you didn't. You inserted a barrier. And the barrier is the worst thing you can do in parallel execution. Um, just to, to give you a, a sense how, where the problem is, the wiglet lines are threads. The, uh, uh, the, the, the vertical squares are idling threads because they have no more work to do. And if you insert even an, a reduction, so just take the sum of all elements in the loop, then you suddenly end with half the time, half the threads are idling, and only half of the threads are doing things, which is again Amdahl, and Amdahl starts beating you over the head again, just because you thought you're smart, and in the end you didn't. You are not, because uh, by using these, these fork join mechanisms, you have parallelism in your system, but you don't reach 100% utilization. So what are those parallel algorithms in, in proposed in the parallelism tiers? Mostly are the same uh, as the sequential algorithms. The only difference, the only interface difference is that the first argument, they have an additional first argument, which is an execution policy, and the proposal predefines three execution policies. One is sequential, uh, parallel, and parallel back. Sequential means that the algorithm essentially falls back to the sequential execution. Parallel means the, the algorithm is somehow executed in parallel, and power back adds vectorization to the, to the picture. And certainly some special rules for exception handling apply, but they are outside the scope of, of, of this talk. All the algorithms are fork join, and they return only after the work has been done, obviously. And so the performance of those algorithms highly depends on the quality of the underlying scheduling system you're using. That's just a list of those algorithms which are proposed. So you will see almost all of those algorithms you love and know from STL are there. Uh, by the way, yet another reason not to write raw for loops, but to use algorithms instead because all you have to do is to put another namespace in front of it, add an, uh, an, another argument to your, to your uh, for each or to your transform, and ta-da, suddenly you have a parallelization, at least in a minimal form in your code. Uh, just a small example, uh, some vector with some numbers, I call the parallel version of transform. So you see, it's, it's the same, same feel, look and feel as, as the standard algorithms we know. What we did in HPX to overcome the fork join problem is we defined new execution policies, which we call parallel task execution policy and sequential task execution policy, uh, which change the semantics of the algorithm in a way that they don't block, but they return immediately and give you a future which represents the, ex the, 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 uh, the end of the execution of the algorithm. So you make your algorithm asynchronous which is exactly what you want to do, because then, even if some cores are start to idle, you can do other works, other work on those cores um, on the side, and you can raise uh, utilization quite a lot. But much more is needed, uh, and we are thinking about making the internal partitions visible to the programmer. We want to integrate that with Eric Niebler's uh, uh, ranges proposal, and I'm working fairly closely with, with Eric on that. So let's see where we get. Um, executors, I'll skip that. R please refer to Detlef's talk. Um, very interesting because it allows you to define affinity or, or special rules where to execute the functions you pass to async or to other, to other entities uh, on a UI thread or on special I.O. threads or so on. That's a killer resumable functions. You might have heard about them, and uh, sorry, I forgot your name. You mentioned that uh, await is just 
in, in the, in the Monat, Monat talk, uh, the speaker mentioned that a weight is a very nice thing to have if it only was a bit more generic. Well, a weight 2.0, the new proposal, is absolutely generic and extensible. And uh, the good thing is it is already implemented in the Microsoft compiler. So if you uh, have the preview of 2015 Visual Studio installed, you can test it out. You can play with it. And we integrated uh, our futures and our, our tasking system with that await, and we have just marvelous results. And uh, I will show you an example uh, why that is very nicely. Just quickly, um, an example, and that's taken directly from Gore's talk at CPPCon. Uh, let's assume uh, we, we have a TCP reader which reads data which comes over the wire. Uh, we have some buffer, some local buffer, and you want to return the number of certain characters in the stream we received. So the first thing we do, we connect to some TCP port remotely. And uh, please note that TCP connect in this case returns a future. And you can use a wait, which is a new keyword, with any expression which evaluates to a future. And what happens when you use a wait on a, on a future is the following. The function returns immediately from uh, the TCP reader, returning the future to the caller, and attaches the rest of the computation as a continuation to the future returned. So essentially, you move all the execution to the side. You don't block. You, you add a continuation to, to, the, to the future at hand. Then you do a while loop. and the connection.read gives you another future which represents the result of the current block of read and then you do some additional things and once you're done you return uh, the, the overall result. Well the beauty of this is that you don't have that inversion of control problem. You're seeing uh, and, and, and you showed it so nicely in your talk that, that kind of spaghetti code which is incomprehensible because you, you write straight code which is still completely asynchronous. So let me make two examples, show you two examples. Uh, the first example is taken from Sean Perrin's uh, talk at C++, um, C++ Seasoning at Going Native 2013. So thanks to, to Sean for that idea. And what he had is, um, let's assume we have a list of items which have a Boolean predicate associated with them. For instance, an email client, you, you mark up several emails uh, then you grab those emails with a mouse and drop them in a different point. How many of you have seen that talk? Oh, many of you. So you remember that it's fairly easy to implement, right? All the others who have not seen Sean talks, you probably scratch your head and think, hmm, I probably would write some fairly horrible code to make that happen. <laughs> well, it's not that bad because if you think about it, essentially you can split that into two problems, one above the red line and one below the red line. And then you see that it's just two partitioning steps, right? Above the line, you want to reorganize your, your uh, elements in a way that first the unmarked, first come the unmarked and then the marked, and below the red line, you want to do the opposite. You want to get first the marked one and then the unmarked one. So STL gives us that. So all we have to do, we call stable partition because we want to change the relative order of the elements on, um, on the two sequences. And we create a new algorithm which we call Gather. Gather takes four, uh, three iterators and a predicate. F and L is the beginning and the end of the, of the overall sequence. P is the insertion point. And the predicate gives you, uh, it's a Boolean predicate which tells you whether a, an element is marked or not. So if you call stable partition first for F to the insertion point, it will partition the first half and then you call partition again for P to L from the insertion point to the end with the inverted predicate, and you return the pair of iterators you get back from, <coughs> from partition, because those iterators you get back mark the boundaries of the selected region after you dropped it into the, into the sequence again. Very useful. So what I want to do, so far, Sean's, Sean's code. What I want to do is to make that asynchronous. So create an algorithm which does the same thing, but completely asynchronous on a side. And that's very simple to do. Um, I called it gather async, just to invent a name. 
and it returns not the pair of iterators, but a future to the pair of iterators, because it's asynchronous. Um, we first called stable partition with a parallel task execution policy. That's what I said. We, that invokes partition in parallel and asynchronously. We get a future back representing the result of the computation. We do the same thing for the second half, which, by the way, runs the two things essentially concurrently, but we don't have any concurrency issues because there's no, no data dependency between the two halves. And then we use data flow. And that looks a bit intimidating at first, but let me explain what it does. Data flow takes a function, which is that unwrapped construct, I'll say a word about that, and the two futures we got back from the, from the partition, al partition al uh, algorithms. Well, if you remember, data flow invokes a function only when the futures become ready. Um, unwrapped, um, and it passes along the futures to the, to the function itself. Unwrap just takes care of unwrapping the future. It just calls get on all the futures and passes along the values which it, it got. So the overall code is simplified. And we return uh, the, the pair of iterators from our function object. And since data flow returns a future to, re to the result of the, of the um, um, function it invokes, it, it gives us exactly what we need. This code is really that inversion of control, has that inversion of control problem, right? You have to kind of turn your brain inside out to, to write that kind of code. And that's what we've been doing for a year or two now in our codes, and which gives us really nice performance. Why gives us that performance? Now, let's think about what have we been doing, actually. We turned our straight code, which executes the algorithm directly, into code which doesn't do anything, except constructing a dependency tree of futures. Right? It returns a future which depends on two other futures. And when those two other futures become ready, the return future become ready, uh, becomes ready. That means that we turned our initial algorithm into a algorithm which generates an execution tree representing the original algorithm, even without executing anything. And if you now use something like HPX under the hood, which does all the scheduling for you, that is equivalent to automatic parallelization, full parallelization. Because the, since these future dependencies are based on continuations, when one of the algorithms returns and makes its future ready, it triggers the next operation. And when both of them are ready, it triggers the final operation. Without doing anything, just the scheduler makes it run very smoothly. And I find that to be amazing because just by running, well, turning code, which is actually doing this stuff, into code which generates an execution tree, which when unraveled does the stuff you need, you gain performance, even if you do things twice as much or twice as long, twice as many code instructions as before. And that was another talk title I had, just I wanted to call it doing, running faster by doing more or something like that. <clears throat> Very interesting. But just to get rid of that inversion of control thing, why just don't, why not use await? And if we have await in the language, and I'm very much in favor of that, and uh, I know that uh, many people in the standardization committee agree that something like that has to happen. Might not be exactly that, but something like that has to happen. You get essentially straight code as before with the semantics I was outlining before from data flow. So you get code which is fully asynchronous, fully parallelizable by the runtime system, and which runs much faster than what you had before because you, because you can utilize your resources in a better way. It's time for a joke somehow. <laughs> um, I know I'm in between your, your weekend and uh, um, between you and your weekend, so I, I'll try to speed up. And it's, it's really not much left. I just have a second example where I want to demonstrate these things uh, by applying it to a distributed matrix transposition example. And then I'll let you go, and I think I'm, I'm almost on time, so we should be done by five o'clock or so. Okay, matrix transposition. Uh, it's a bit more involved, that example, but it, it applies the same techniques to, uh, as I outlined for the, for the async, uh, guesser async. For those who, doesn't, who don't know what, what a matrix transposition is, well, it's 
trivial stuff. You have a matrix and you just flip the, the two axes of the, of the matrix, essentially. And what do I want to do? I want to copy all the elements of A into another matrix, which I call B. Let's assume they are quadratic. So everything's easy, no, no, no big problems there. Uh, just a simplified code, how you would probably write it, is you create two vectors. Order is just the size of one dimension of the, of the matrix of doubles. Then you call transpose, and transpose will take the elements of A and copy them just transposed into the matrix B. I left off all the initialization, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, the numbers used don't matter. And the transpose function above is really just a loop in the loop which goes over, over the elements and, and assigns the elements in an appropriate way. If you want to, I hope I got the indices right, so uh, it actually works, we, we tried it out. And if you download HPX, you will find all those code examples in the repository so you can run it yourself and, and play with it. Well, the standard way of doing, or the, the classic way of doing that is just to add a OpenMP uh, statement to parallelize the outer loop. And I'll show you that because we did that for comparison reasons, and, and in the end I will show you some numbers comparing the different versions of, of the transpose algorithms I, I will demonstrate. Uh, let's first just use a parallel algorithm for that thing. <coughs> Um, it's a bit more complicated because just to main maintain and retain the inner loop, I'm using special iterators from Boost, the iRange iterator. So iRange is essentially an, int an integer range uh, which acts as a container, and when you call begin, you get the begin iterator and the end iterator, and the iterator dereference gives you the incremented numbers. And um, the i... Uh, argument passed to the lambda essentially corresponds to the index, and, and the, the parallel for loop will, will go through the, the, the uh, index range uh, the i range was constructed from. Same thing, uh, very simple. No surprises here. Okay, so now let's do that in a distributed way. Let's assume our matrix is so large it doesn't fit into the memory of a single node. Let's say a million by a million elements. And let's say we, we have enough memory in four nodes. We can split it up into four nodes and connect in a cluster, connect it with a network, and just say I, I split the data in a way that, that I have a piece of the matrix on e each of the nodes. Um, so my ID is just the ID of the, of the node I will focus on. And I do the same for the, for the destination metrics, where I want to copy things to. So let's thing, set things up. Um, and here we have to look a, a bit at HPX, um, but not too much. I will try to explain what it's doing. Uh, get locality ID gives you just what in MPI world is called rank. It's just a sequential number of the current node this code is executed on. And please note, the code we see will be executed on all four nodes at the same time. So you have to kind of stretch your imagination how that works. Uh, num blocks is set to the number of localities involved. In our case, it's probably four. And the block order is the size of the, the amount of lines on each of the nodes, which is just the order divided by the number of nodes we have. Um, block is a special data structure, and I will, will say a word about that in, in a minute, which represents the data of one of the, of the stripes of the matrix, but it represents it in a way that you can remotely access that data from any node. Um, I, I kind of do a bit hand-waving here because I don't want to go too deeply into HPX. Just assume it works, okay? And it does work. Um, we initialize things in the way I outlined it by just having two vectors, A and B, but this time the two vectors, A and B, represent the references to the stripes in the matrices. So A and B have four elements each, um, and um, I, I loop over those elements, and if I hit the index which corresponds to the node I'm running on, then I initialize that block, I create that memory, and if I'm at an index which refers to the blocks on the other nodes, then I just ask HPX to give me a reference to those, to those blocks. And the, the concrete syntax is, is, is uh, not too important. 
just to know that register ID with base name essentially takes a current node and registers this with the system so that the other nodes can find it and get, get references to it. And find ID from base name gives you the reference from which was registered before um, um, by one of the other nodes. Have I lost everybody? Everybody's still with me? It doesn't get much more complicated. So let's, let's get back to that image. What we want to do here is to take us some couple of columns and split them up and transpose them piecewise. Because what we now have to do, each of the nodes has to access a piece of another node of a stripe in the other node, right? So in order to construct that stripe on, on the node my ID, I have to access those four blocks from those four columns from the different nodes, obviously, and transpose it when, when I get the data. So let's do that. And I do a, for each here, please note it's sequential to avoid uh, race conditions just for simplicity. Um, what this does, um, phase is just the number of, of the block I'm, I'm looking at. So uh, what this does is this block data structure I had has a member function which is called get data, which gives me the data from the node number I'm passing in and the, the number of the block. Um, and the trick of get data is that if the data is local, it gives me a reference without copying the data. And if the data is remote, it copies it over to the local node and gives me a reference to the local stuff. Okay? And I do that for both, for the, des for the source and for the destination for each of the, of the transpose operations I want to do. And then I use data flow with the two futures I, I got back uh, and call the transpose functions when both references are available. And that's very important because the, if, if I refer to a remote block, it takes 100 times longer to get to the data than if I access a, a local block because a local block is just a point operation. The remote block is networking, copying data, and so on and so on. And as we saw with a with fork join picture I showed you, if the threads take different time, which I spawn out in my threads, then I end up usually with, with a lot of free and spare time. So I, in the principle, I wanted to have all the threads running uh, for the same amount of time, which is impossible in that case. But by using data flow and by constructing that execution tree, and what I do here, I construct an execution tree, because you can see there's a vector of future voids and whatever data flow returns is a future representing the finalization of that particular transpose operation. And in the end, I wait for all of them. That results represents the execution tree for all of the transpose operations in the system. And since they take different time and runtime system executes all of those nodes in that execution tree as soon as all the preconditions are met because when, well, when the network is done, it executes that particular one. You keep your resources nicely going without having to put effort into load balancing, into anything. Um, so let, if you use await, same thing. The code gets much, much cleaner than before. And please note, I now have a parallel for loop because now I don't have to watch out for the results variable, which is shared between the, possibly shared between different executions, iterations of the, of, the, of the loop. So I get even better performance than before. And fairly straightforward code without having to worry about and to think about parallelism too much. Okay, a couple of numbers. Um, this shows you the execution of different versions of that, of that code I showed. Uh, the dark blue one is the OpenMP code I showed in the beginning. The uh, green one is an MPI code I, I haven't shown, so let's ignore that for now. The red one shows you the uh, use of the parallel for each implemented in HPX. As you can see, we have a lot of work to do just to, to get it as performant as OpenMP. But the light blue one is the code and the time you get by executing that uh, futurized version of the block trans transpose algorithm 
I was explaining uh, last. So you can see just by doing much more, by constructing that tree and by doing all that stuff and then execute it in parallel with full speed without any suspension points, gives you a massive improvement over a proven technology which has been developed for 30 years. And trust me, Intel has, I don't know, 300 people employed just to make OpenMP fast. So don't tell me, I, I'm not saying they are, they are bad engineers, by no means, it's all marvelous engineers. But OpenMP has, because of that fork join model, has shortcomings which are not due to the implementation but due to the specification and the API. So just by overcoming these old programming models, you can gain massive performance. And not because HPX code is running faster, you gain performance because you utilize resources in better ways. You, you, you have more work to done, you have less idle time, you reduce the four horsemen, the effect of the four horsemen in your code. And now the same code on the Xeon Phi. I don't know if you know what a Xeon Phi is, some people probably know that by now. It's essentially a coprocessor board you plug into your machine, which gives you 60 cores, four hardware threads each. So 240 hard hardware threads. And uh, that just shows the number of cores. Just imagine that's 400, 240 hardware threads. And here you can see that our parallel algorithm suddenly shines. Just by switching to the HPX parallel algorithm, which is a red line, you get a much better performance than OpenMP. So now you might wonder why, you know, some guys from the middle of nowhere in Louisiana come up with some scheme which works reasonably well. And they out write code just with 10 lines of code, which runs faster than OpenMP, which has been developed by 300 people at Intel. That sounds unbelievable. But that's exactly what I mean. That's the, the disadvantage of using these technologies which have been designed and developed for technology we've been using 25 years ago. And we still keep on to them because that's the only thing we have. Uh, again, the blocked HPX version is the best one because it, it constructs that execution tree and, and then runs it in, in parallel. And OpenMP is just, yeah, runs home and cries for mama or so. I don't know. Okay. Uh, conclusions. And you're almost done. Yay, weekend. Multicore is here to stay. It's a new modality of computing, and we all know that. I don't tell you anything new. But we need higher level abstractions for threading and parallelism. The goal should be to make the data dependencies explicit. And those execution trees constructed by your initial algorithm just by applying these monadic transforms to the code, by futurizing the code, just make the data dependencies explicit. It's nothing else, right? You just define what has to happen in what order by attaching continuations to the futures. And that allows you to reason about massively parallel code. Uh, transposing a matrix of a million by a million uh, values on, I don't know, 1,024 cores runs a couple of million threads in, uh, in, in, in a fraction of a second, essentially. Uh, C++14 and 11 already define some basic types, but we need much, much more. Uh, many C++ standardization proposals are being currently discussed. Several TSs uh, will be released shortly. So as soon as that happens, I expect Clang and GCC and all the compiler vendors to implement that. If you don't want to wait for that to happen, there's HPX to download and to try. And there are many more things in the pipeline and I have touched only the, the, the things which are about to be released. And my last message is, so stop using planes, plain threads after all. There's no need to use those. And if you tell me that using plain threads is important because you want to get performance, I hope that I proved you wrong. Thank you very much. I don't think you have questions. Everybody wants to run home. 
No? Any questions? Uh, could you explain um, you in, in these performance uh, charts you had gigabits per second or something? Yeah. Could you explain how um, how this relates to the matrix transposition performance? Well, it's just the bandwidth. How many bytes we have transposed in a second? Okay. That's it. I, I thought it was. Um, it's not it, that it confused no, me it's, it's because it's really the amount yeah, of okay. data moved. Okay. That's thanks. I like having these values on, on, on the performance charts much more than some scaling graphs because it gives you a better, better idea of what's actually going on. Um, do you have some insights in how this works for real-time environments? The oh, things that you sorry, showed so you far work well on batch jobs, but how do they work on real-time uh, real scheduled jobs? Sorry, I, I didn't get that. On, on what environments? On a uh, real-time environment, for real -time instance, one with a deadline. Okay, the question is how does it work on real-time environments? Um, we haven't done anything to make it work on real-time environments. So HPX itself doesn't implement any uh, guarantees or it doesn't give you any guarantees in terms of execution on real-time constraints. Uh, that's something which can be added, but I'm not able to answer how much effort that would be or, or what the real-time constraints would be if you implemented it. So um, this may sound uh, rude, but uh, I'm wondering um, where does C++'s unique touch come in? Um, to me, it looks like uh, we are playing catch up with other languages. Uh, I we agree. have mentioned uh, Scala, we have mentioned uh, Haskell in talks today. And um, it, it just, um, I, I mean, for, for closures, uh, for lambdas, we decided Okay, there has to be this unique touch to um, give C++ programmers the chance to shoot this themselves in the foot by um, adding um, the ability for dynamic scoping, where all other language implementers know that static scoping is the way to go. So it, it seems like for um, everything related to uh, multithreading, we come to the conclusion that others have done it right. And maybe we should um, have a combined effort to um, solve the problems of multithreading and b b because um, multithreading and, and many cores is here to stay. You should give the next keynote next year. <laughs> uh, sorry, I have no answer to that because I wasn't involved in the standardization of, of, what, of the features you were referring to. The, the touch which C++ definitely adds to the picture, even if it's playing catch-up, is performance. And there's no doubt. And that's why it's so important that we catch up and that we create features which allow the mere mortal programmer to write massively parallel code uh, with C++, which is not possible today. Um, I'm just curious, uh, in your charts where you had the comparison for the Xeon Phi, you used a smaller matrix size than for the uh, Intel Core, I think was the other one. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, sure. Xeon Phi is a smaller device. Okay. I mean, so it, if it you actually go to the same size, you will get uh, performance degradation because of more uh, memory well, I, I, I'm not sure what would happen if you, well, you have to fit the memory into the main memory of the device, right? And the, the Xeon Phi has eight gigabytes, something like that. So we had to reduce the size. And the second thing is uh, the Xeon Phi is a much slower device than the Xeon core, right? It runs on 1.2 gigahertz or so. Mm. Um, I, I don't have the numbers with me how it looks like when you change the matrix size. I really just picked two illustrative examples and it might, might have completely unexpected uh, results or it might look uh, the same, so I don't know. More questions? I saw a couple of other Yeah, more Yeah, answers. I have okay. a question. I'm interested in the performance comparisons again. Um, do we have a more detailed analysis of the OpenMP um, performance or where is the time lost in OpenMP? Is it 
different memory access? Is it waiting at some barrier or? It's the implicit barrier after the for loop. Uh, OpenMP on the Xeon Phi sucks. And the reason is that it has to join the threads over 240 hardware threads. And that join operation alone costs you 30 to 50 microseconds per, re per join. And that kills your performance because it's MDAL's law. It adds these, I don't know, as much sequential time to the, to the execution as you actually execute the, the for loop. And that is what's killing the performance. Okay, so, so it's, it, I think it's only a single parallel, a single loop. Uh, it's it's just, in that case, just a single yeah. loop, yes. Okay. Well, that's the numbers, right? That's all I can say. And the only explanation we have is really that is that implicit barrier at the end of the for loop, of, of, of the uh, parallel for loop. I think we, we ran that not, one t not only once, but 100 times just to get some, some reasonable averaging of, of the, so it, the effect might, might, be, might be larger than just the one. Other questions? Well, if you have a heterogeneous system, such as the system that you have with uh, Xenon Phi's accelerators, yes. and then also lots of Intel, normal Intel CPU cores, um, are you working on or working towards or considering mechanisms to um, choose which threads are run on the accelerator and which ones are run on the CPUs? Well, currently, HPX, what we did with HPX, and I'm not sure if it's appropriate to talk H about HPX here because the talk is really about other things, but what we did with HPX in the first step is to implement the low-level interfaces where everything is explicit. So the programmer is responsible for doing all the load balancing, the data distribution. We all only give the mechanisms like migration of data or, or distribution of, of data and, and so on to the programmer. Um, I really hope to find people who are interested in going to the next level and to implement the magic on top of that, like the parallel algorithms or so. Uh, so we consider that, but we haven't implemented it. So currently, you, uh, the programmer, is given access to low level. Yes. Um, well, you've seen API the API to do this, but you have to do everything yeah. explicit. You have seen the API, and we have executors in the API, so you can control what threads or what cores you run things on if you want to. But you have to do it yourself at this point. Other questions? Hartmut? Yes. Can you go back to slide 45, I think? 45? Yes. That one? Oh, no, sorry, then. I think it was the other example with a weight, the first one, which the I could still understand. Yeah. That one? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I really like the idea behind a weight, and I believe I understand how we are supposed to use a weight. But I wonder whether now I look at this example, whether it is something which can also be implemented as a compiler optimization. So instead of us using a weight in the code and uh, changing the return types of functions to use uh, std future, is it something where um, we could implement the logic uh, as a compiler optimization because the compiler could see that in this case stable partition could be called uh, in parallel into threads and could then kind of automatically uh, wait for the two threads and return them from this function gather async. So I wonder whether this is something we all could get for free. That would be of course great. I'm not a compiler writer. So I can't really answer that question. Uh, you should talk to Chandler. <laughs> okay, he I might have an opinion on, to, on that. Um, so it might be possible, it might be not. That case is trivial because essentially you have a call, uh, uh, call CC. You, you call with a, with a con uh, current continuation and uh, uh, tail recursion kicks in and, and, and things like that. Um, might be possible, I don't know. But I like to have it explicit, frankly. So I, I always prefer the explicit solution because the compiler writers promise us for 20 years that they get the parallelization of loops under control. And they got something under control, but it's still not there, right? So I'd rather make it myself and have control over things. Hi, I have a couple of questions. So suppose you trans transformed your 
code to use the data flows. Um, now you have a lot of the small tasks around. Yep. And um, what about, can you report somehow a progress, like uh, how much time is left or how much time remaining? Is it, is it part of the library or is it supposed to be some uh, additional information you need to pass around? And similarly for errors, if uh, an exception happens somewhere, you kind of don't have a stack, a full stack, like you used to have in yeah. sequential execution. Well, so. uh, I'll answer the second question first, the exception thing. It's well defined by the standard how futures have to handle exceptions. Namely, the exception is marshaled back to the future, and when you call get on the future, it will be rethrown if you don't do anything about it. Um, uh, HPX just extends that to the remote case. So if you execute something remote and an exception happens and you have the future locally, then the exception is marshaled back and, and you can handle the remote exceptions as well. Um, and what was the other question? Sorry. The progress, the estimation, estimated time. Ah, the progress. To um, you can easily insert your own additional nodes in the execution tree, which then report the progress. Right? It's just another dependency you insert somewhere while you construct that execution tree. In the same way as you would do that in the normal code, right? Every hundred iterations you do that. And here you just, every hundred iteration, you insert another node into your dependency and, and then it will report that whenever that point is reached. Yeah. One more question perhaps. How is your experience with using the parallel, for example, algorithms? Like, would you use it everywhere, or do you need to, to use a profiler first to actually figure out, okay, this is a hot path that would benefit from being parallelized because of the overhead, right? So if the problem size is too small, I wouldn't oh. want to use it blindly or something like that? Well, I think you answered your question yourself. Okay, so even with profiler. HPX, the overhead is too high to always use Mal parallel. Well, the overhead is sub-microsecond per thread, I told you. And if you have, um, and, and the, alg the algorithms we implemented in HPX have some auto-tuning in there. They just execute, I don't know, a couple of iterations, 1% of the iterations measure how long does it take, and then they, they build the partitions depending to amortize better. But if you have only a few, uh, few iterations anyway with very small work, this might create more overhead than, than you had, had before. So it's always a good idea to do these, these measurements. And that's independently of HPX, that's the general rule of thumb. Okay, thank you so much and have a nice weekend.